My name is Joanne Clark, and I'm the administrative director of the Ludmere Center. Welcome. So just for those of you who don't, don't already know what the Ludmere Center is, basically, we're a research center that was set up with the generous donation of the Irving, the Irving Ludmere Family Foundation in 2013. And our goal is to advance big data, a big data approach to brain research. We have three basic pillars. The first one is we develop and ensure global access to innovative neuroinformatics infrastructure and databases, and you'll hear about those tonight. We also support Ludmere Center researchers to lead big data research into normal and abnormal brain development. You're also going to hear about that tonight. And we catalyze future research by training and supporting the next generation of brain scientists, tomorrow's innovators and leaders in big data research. And you're gonna meet one of those tonight, one of our key uh, researchers. The first person who's going to be speaking tonight is, is going to be telling us about why data sharing initiatives are very important. This person is Dr. Howard Turco, a senior investigator and director of the Bloomfield Center for Research and Aging at the Jewish General's Lady Davis Institute. Dr. Churko is a cognitive neurologist and co-founder and director of the McGill Memory Clinic at the Jewish General Hospital, the largest such clinic in Canada. He's among Canada's leading researchers in Alzheimer's and dementia. I urge you to look at his profile on the Jewish General Hospital's website because I could not do it justice here tonight. Suffice to say that Dr. Churko's research in Alzheimer's disease underpins treatment protocols and physician training across Canada and internationally. Locally, he also led the connection axis of the FRSQ network on aging and was a key member of the 2008 Quebec committee mandated to draw up provincial strategies for dementia management. So if you're unhappy with the management, you know how to go to. <laughs> Currently, he sits on the Research Advisory Board of the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and is the only non-American sitting on a committee that funds Alzheimer's disease research centers across the United States. Today, we've asked Dr. Churko to speak to us about the importance of data sharing initiatives to Alzheimer's research and specifically the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging, for which he is the scientific director. Dr. Evans tells me that Bringing together over 400 Canadian researchers under one collaboration is nothing short of a Herculean feat. So I'd like you to please welcome Dr. Howard Tricko. Thank you for that very nice introduction. I really like the picture too. I think it, <laughs> something has changed since I'm I'm not sure what, but um, so I, I'm just delighted to be here, and I want to to thank the the directorship of the Ludmer Center and uh, Irving Ludmer and his family sitting here in the front row. And it's a, a real pleasure to see so many people here demonstrating the interest in, in dementia and in research here at uh, McGill University. Um, so I, I think people are here because of the interest in. Uh, Alzheimer's disease and the concern about it in the community. Um, these are just two of the Time magazine covers on Alzheimer's disease over the past few years. Why are we so concerned? What the num numbers are, are con what are concerning to us is that if we look at Canadians and we look at our own families, we see that in the past few years there were about three quarters of a million people with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias in Canada and as the population ages because as we have an aging population this is going to more than double over the next 20 years so this is a, a big concern not only for for people like me who are baby boomers coming into their senior years but we're the ones who are now looking after elderly parents who are worried about if you're in your 40s or 50s you're worried about what is coming for me as I get into the the older age group so we're living longer Alzheimer's and the degenerative dementias we're talking about tonight are diseases of aging this is the big risk factor so we're, we have to deal with this in the the future as we get older this slide coming from the the Canadian government points out that women are more affected than men, so this is very much a women's issue. And it's very much an economic issue because the number of people affected may double. The price tag for Canada and Canadians is going to go up by a factor of 10. So we have big problems and this threatens to overwhelm our healthcare system in the next 20 years. 
Um, the key points regarding dementia are that the cause and causes of Alzheimer's disease and the other diseases we lump under the dementias, uh, they're not known. We don't know the cause of these diseases. There's been no new Alzheimer's disease treatment in the past 15 years. We have no curative or disease-modifying therapy for any of the dementias, but we have a tremendous amount of new knowledge. We know more about the time course, risk factors, biomarkers. You're going to hear from Dr. Breitner. And uh, the, we have potential preventive strategies. So there's all this knowledge coming, a big problem, how are we going to cope with it? And big data is one of the approaches towards trying to find a solution. You should know that Canada punches above its weight in the dementia field. Uh, we, we do better, we're more recognized internationally for dementia than almost any other area of medical research. Nevertheless, the Canadian government spends about one-tenth per capita of what the United States spends and one-quarter of what they spend in Britain and Australia. So we need pressure from people in the public to, when you're meeting with people running for election provincially and federally to say, what are you doing for dementia and finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease? Unless there's more public pressure, the, the funding which is necessary is not going to increase. Nevertheless, in 2012, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, the federal funding body came up with a dementia research strategy, which had an international component to try to, to create uh, uh, synergy between Canada and other countries, and a national program setting up what's called the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging, CCNA. I've been told this is a terrible name, but we're stuck with it, so this is the, the name we have. So, the CCNA is uh, uh, this big organization of which I'm privileged to be the scientific director. It was funded as a five-year initiative of the Canadian government and it's going to come up for renewal in 2019. And the idea is to have research to accelerate the discovery and innovation and adoption of new knowledge, trying to aim at prevention, treatment and management of these diseases of aging. And our goal is to improve the quality of life of individual Canadians living with dementias and ensure that Canada remains and stays at the forefront of initiatives to combat the increasing impact of what we call neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, the, the national base for the CCNA, uh, now I guess I should have a, a, a pointer, but the national base is at the Jewish General Hospital in the Lady Davis Institute where, where I spend most of my time. This is a, a map of Montreal showing the involvement of researchers in Montreal, not only at the Jewish General, but other institutions of McGill, the MUHC, McGill University where we are now, and the Montreal Neurologic Institute where the database LORIS, which you're going to hear about, is based. Somehow this can, Apparently it tells us that it takes an hour and 37 minutes to drive from all these institutes. This must be, like my picture, I think this is a very old diagram. <laughs> I don't think you can do this route in, in an hour and 37 minutes. But we also have very big um, involvement from the Institut de Geriatrie at University of Montreal and Concordia University. So this tries to underline how all the researchers were at different institutions, different universities, were working together to try to find cures now. And this is just a list of the people in Montreal and you'll see uh, Dr. John Breitner's name is there under the, the people at the Douglas and Alan Evans' name under the, the people at the Montreal Neurologic Institute. So, so the people who are the experts locally and provincially and in, in Canada are pretty much all involved in this effort. What we've done is set up national teams. We've set up 20 teams, and it might be hard to read this, but they range from teams looking at basic science and genetics all the way to looking at new treatments and gerund technology and how to uh, change the healthcare systems to make them more amenable to supporting patients and their families. The, the teams in blue are the ones led from here in Montreal and the teams in red deal with sort of social and psychological issues because dementia is a medical problem but, but patients have to deal with things such as stigma, the healthcare system and uh, so, uh, things like driving sensation. There are social problems as well that have, we have to have research on how to handle these. Interestingly, we have a one team, Team 20, that focuses on dementia in rural populations and in the indigenous population of Canada, where we have about a three times the rate of dementia of everybody else. These teams are all national. What we've done is force people working in one area to work together, irrespective of their university or their institutions. And, and researchers 
are, are coming out of their silos and realizing that what we need is big data and big teams. So people are, are quite willing now to work together rather than independently. The teams play to Canadian research strengths and they have a five-year research program with deliverables they're going to produce during this time. And we're encouraging them because we couldn't give them all the money they need, they're going to take money from the CCNA and look for funding from other agencies nationally and internationally is helping them a lot. Uh, about 15 of the teams will leverage a, a large cohort that we're setting up and we're in the process of establishing called Compass ND, which stands for Comprehensive Assessment of Neurodegenerative Diseases. And this is Canada's foray into what we will call deep big data. What we're doing is recruiting a cohort across the country of 650 individuals who are volunteers with different kinds of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease, um, uh, frontotemporal dementia, these are different diseases that produce states of dementia. And these individuals who are all volunteers, mainly at memory clinics across the country, go through a very complicated set of visits where we take their history, we examine them, we, uh, um, let's see, do we have, a, do we have a pointer? I guess not. We give them questionnaires, memory testing, we take biosamples, we take their blood, we take their spinal fluid. We take fecal samples and look at their microbiome, the bacteria that live in their gut, and then we do imaging with MRI scanning. And finally, uh, if they're willing to, they, they can choose to donate their brains in the, the event that they die, and then we study their brains along with the, the data that we collected during life. So for each individual, millions of pieces of data are collected, including their entire genome, all the genes that have to do with the brain. Uh, so this is going to provide what we call deeply phenotype cohorts with extensive clinical information, genetic information, imaging, psychology, biosamples, and we're going to follow these people longitudinally. It's, it's a, a huge enterprise generating a tremendous amount of data. Uh, and all of this data is going to be accessible on a world-class data management system called LORIS that you're going to hear a bit about from Alan Evans. This was created in, in Alan's lab and is a fundamental part of the, the letter which is uh, uh, now housing it. Now housing it. Uh, so this is going to eventually allow researchers from around the world to get access to this data and, and help in this discovery. So it's going to help Canadian researchers but also it's going to help researchers around the world. So this is a, a slide on Loris, and uh, I'm going to leave this for Alan to, to talk about. So CCNA is going to make progress, we hope, by creating new synergies. We've got the whole dementia research community in Canada working together, new targets. We're going to be studying all the dementias, not only Alzheimer's disease, so we can study common mechanisms ac across the different diseases, one of them being inflammation that I think John Breitner is going to be speaking about. And we're going to entertain new theories of causation uh, of disease and new targets for therapies. Which brings us to the, the ultimate idea, which is developing new therapies and new treatments. I said we don't have treatments for these diseases other than the cholinesterase inhibitors such as Aricept that, that help some of the symptoms but do not stop the disease. So we want to help the basic scientists working on animal models take them into human studies and trials in humans. And uh, you should know that Alzheimer's disease has been very difficult to devise therapies for. This is a slide that comes from Friends in Pharma. This is sort of the pipeline for different diseases. And if you look, you can see, if you're in the pharmaceutical industry trying to develop a treatment for hepatitis C, about 2% of the, the molecules you try end up coming to market. In Alzheimer's disease, it's 0.5%. So it's very hard to develop new therapies. Um, why is that? Well, people are, do not know the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And think of finding the therapy is getting to the top of the top of this mountain where the goal is to find a treatment that will prevent Alzheimer's disease. But it's a misty mountain. We don't know the path that will get us to the top. The main two paths that people are pursuing are looking at the protein amyloid and the protein tau. But so far, those have not led to, to therapies. If you look on the other side of the mountain, uh, you see a list of researchers in Canada who are trying different approaches to treatments for Alzheimer's disease. We don't know which of those paths will get us to the top, so our approach is to try to, to support the greatest number of scientists working on different pathways. Maybe we need a combination of treatments and not just one. 
these pathways are, are I list some of them here, I don't have time to go into them, but we, we think there are multiple pathways that might be involved in causing Alzheimer's disease and might be amenable to treatment. So where does big data come in? So as I've said, the, we're, we're trying to collect a whole lot of data in a large number of people beside, because we're starting to understand that maybe Alzheimer's disease isn't due to one chemical failure, maybe there's a web of causation of this disease, multiple changes that produce a cascade in the brain. So this is a very complex disease, but not only is it complex at the genetic and the molecular level, but we understand there are things in the environment. We're maybe seeing a little piece of the puzzle above the water, but underneath there we have to think about questions of effects of the environment, injury, poverty, poor education, pollution, stress, even loneliness, factors in the person's exposome, in the, the world outside, that impact on causing the disease. So this is a whole other dimension of understanding. In addition, we now know there are risk factors and protective factors. We can make a list of factors such as the risk factors that, that increase your risk of getting Alzheimer's and dementia and a whole set of other protective factors that produce what we call cognitive reserve that protect you from this disease. So it's a very complicated picture. The new view of dementia, therefore, is that it's a complex condition with complex interplay between genes that you're born with, chemicals, the environment, and, and cognitive reserve. And there may be a web of causes, and it's a very heterogeneous. It's not everyone is the same. It's not everyone has the same causation. So how are we going to get to understand these diseases? Well, this is where big data comes into play. There are two kinds of big data we're interested in broad big data where we get a very large set of individuals. We may just get a bit of information from each of them and put it into our database. And what we call deep big data, where we have detailed evaluation of individuals with these diseases. And we can try and link these two kinds of big data to promote understanding of the diseases. And hopefully, looking at these large data sets will allow us to find unsuspected subgroups of patients, unsuspected interactions between the genes, the environment, in the causation of dementia in every individual, and maybe subgroups that respond to particular combinations of therapy. So we can't expect that the same treatment is going to apply to everybody. Maybe there are subgroups that have to be treated differently. So the only way to approach this is to have large data cohorts, and this is where, where we come in and the Ludmer Center comes in. And this is going on around the world. For example, in the United Kingdom, there's a biobank where they're enrolling 500,000 individuals, 100,000 will get brain imaging. There are cohorts in California and Seattle. We have a large normal aging cohort in Canada called the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging. There's ADNI in the United States, and now there's CCNA, our Canadian cohort, where we're going to enroll these 1,650 individuals, deep data, big data, very extensive information followed over time. And we hope that we will find new information, things we may not even have suspected. And there are examples coming in where big data sets have been examined, and things you didn't suspect come out of the analysis. So big data, and this is the only, my last two slides, so you've seen one slide that says, what is big data? Big data is data where you've got the four Vs we talk about, a large volume of data, large numbers of individuals studied, variety, lots of different kinds of data variables brought together, velocity, that means that there's a change over time, we update the data sets and follow people over time, and veracity, truthfulness, it has to be high quality data that, that can be replicated around the world. So how are we going to create big data sets that are, are going to, to help us? Well, we need large cohorts such as the CCNA, but we also need new things which are quite new in science, collaboration between scientists within a country and between countries. We need open access and sharing of data, and Alan Evans is going to talk about this a little later. We need to create a new culture of open science and data sharing so that people aren't getting the data and keeping it only for themselves. And we need collaborative support to, for intense evaluation of this data and new approaches to analytics and new tools. And Celia Greenwood and other members of the Ludmer Center are, are experts in this area. And finally, we may need private-public partnerships to get us the, the funding to create these things. Uh, whoops. So last slide, what are we doing in Canada then? We're creating these large data sets, 
and we've established memoranda of understanding and partnerships with other countries, such as the UK Dementia Platform. We're engaging partners to create data dictionaries and, and other innovations to provide ability to share across platforms and systems and countries. And we're moving into an area where we're funding big data and dementia grants to link data sets with health utilization data and bring us the data on genomics, epigenetics, the exposome, the environment, the bacterial uh, gut flora. And finally, we're bringing in open science initiatives, and I think Alan might speak to this uh, uh, again in a few minutes. So is big data a new way to get us up to the mountaintop? We certainly hope so, because we need every uh, advantage in getting us through this, the mists of the mountain to find what is going to be the way to get to the top and find a way to stop the dementias. And on that note, I'll thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Churko. Our next guest is Dr. Alan Evans. Dr. Evans is a James McGill professor and, and director of the McGill Center for Integrative Neuroscience. He's a 60-member of the 60-member research and informatics team at the, uh, at the Montreal Neurological Institute and Hospital. He's also a scientific director of the Ludmer Center and McGill's ambitious neuroscience initiative, Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives which just recently received 84 million under the Canada First Research Excellence Initiative. Dr. Evans' research has developed important biomarkers for the early diagnosis of neurological and psychiatric diseases and pioneered neuroimaging techniques and neuroinformatics technologies that are now universally utilized. Although a leading researcher in neuroimaging, today we've asked Dr. Evans to speak about his lab's neuroinformatics tools and platforms. These informatics tools were initially built to support his neuroimaging research, but thanks to tireless efforts by Dr. Evans, these soon became the cornerstone of multiple big data initiatives around the world. Testament to his global reach, among his staff and researchers, they speak some 26 languages, including, as Dr. Evans is fond of telling us, Welsh, his native tongue. <laughs> McGill only only recently realized the significance of Dr. Evans' neuroinformatics capacity. They've always recognized his brilliance in neuroimaging. But now they recognize that he's really advancing neuroinformatics, and they've taken it to heart, and they've made it a cornerstone of McGill's neuroscience initiatives. I also say only recently because, as McGill, McGill was rather like the parent who woke up one day to realize that their computer-savvy kids had built a multi-million dollar enterprise in their business, and now needed a healthy investment in order to take it to the next level. Anyway, please welcome Dr. Alan Evans. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Joanne. Um, before I start, I, I should say that uh, Howie Cherko and I have traveled the world together on many occasions. And uh, more than one occasion, uh, people would say to us, are you two twins? Not anymore. <laughs> I, also, I also learned a new word today, exposome, Howie. It's, it's a good word. I'm going to have to make use of that. Uh, normally, I, I give a talk which is a mixture of uh, nuts and bolts and science sitting on top of that, those nuts and bolts. Well, um, Joanne took away my, my, the strongest parts of my science talk and gave it to uh, Yasser Aturi Medina. Yasser is a postdoc in my lab who I, I believe is one of the smartest people in the world to describe mechanisms of, of brain disorders. It's been a privilege to work with him because most of, most of the time I just say, good job, Yasser. You know, <laughs> you will hear more from, uh, about Yasser's work uh, in due course. So it is, it's, it's left to me to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts behind the science. So this is the problem that we face. We have information that goes all the way from molecular and uh, all the way through cellular to behavior and everything in between. Not only that, it's not just the data you collect in your own lab anymore. Increasingly, there's a, there's a culture around the world of sharing data that just really didn't, didn't exist 10, 20 years ago. Uh, so these are just examples of uh, from just my, my uh, imaging background 
of data that's placed in the public domain where anybody can get access to and, and uh, process it and um, extract new findings from those data. So it's no longer just two or three people in your lab. It's the whole world. So there's a global culture which has arisen in the last 10 years. And one of those uh, of particular relevance to this group is the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging in Initiative, which is uh, a cohort of about uh, uh, 2,000 subjects that were collected across the U.S. and about 60 sites in the U.S. They collected all of this information and they made it available to the world. And hundreds of papers have come out of this. So it's really accelerated our understanding of dementia in general. How he described the CCNA, uh, same thing in the Canadian context, but interestingly, whereas this was much more restricted to um, uh, pure forms of disease, CCNA is taking the opposite tack and saying, we're going to take all comers, which will often mean there are comorbidities. Scientifically, in the past, that would have been considered a bad move, because then you have many confounding factors. When we now have the analytic machinery to beat the data to death and extract much more information about the mechanisms of comorbidity, that heterogeneity of the cohort in the CCNA becomes a strength, and I think it makes uh, the Canadian cohort quite unique in the world, and we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what we can extract from, from the CCNA. But still, we have this problem. <laughs> Yeah, you know this problem. So uh, the, the Ludmer Center came into existence about uh, four or five years ago. And as we've, we've talked about already, it brings together uh, my lab, how we, uh, um, uh, Cecilia Greenwood's lab at the Jewish, and Michael Meany's lab at the, uh, at the Douglas, plus a, a whole cohort of colleagues and partners. The Ludmer Center has become the engine of this new initiative that has just uh, arisen in, in uh, Montreal, Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives. And as you heard, it was an $84 million grant, but the, the heart of that whole initiative was information science comes to neuroscience, and particularly clinical translational research. So the Ludmer Center was there first, and the Ludmer Center gave rise to this momentum that we are, we are seeing here in, in uh, Montreal. The goals of the uh, HBHL, I call it Hubble for simplicity's sake, and everybody says, well, yeah, isn't that confusing? I don't think so, because a microscope in the brain is exactly the analogy I would like to create. So when you hear me say Hubble, I mean healthy brains for healthy lives. Its goal is to understand the individual brain, to combine all of that information from different uh, spatial uh, levels. You need advanced analytic platforms and comp computation to process that data, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Importantly, the goal is, uh, the major outcomes are clinical translation of this bas basic research, and indeed commercialization of that basic research. And ultimately, by 2022, a Canadian framework for brain health, where dementia is going to be a central element in, in uh, how we bridge the gap, so sometimes called the valley of death, between basic research and clinical utility. A core principle of what we're talking about here is, is shown here. On the left, you have the more traditional perspective of the relationship between genes and diseases. The problem is different genes or gene clusters code for different mechanisms, and those aberrant mechanisms can be found in many different diseases. So it becomes very messy. What we're looking at within our big data approach is to use a mechanism-based approach where the gene or gene clusters code for a specific mechanism. Those mechanisms may appear in multiple disorders, but it's the mechanism that is amenable to intervention, whether it's pharmaceutical or genetic or indeed uh, beha behavior can be targeted to specific mechanisms. So this is a different way of looking at, the, at, at brain disorders and brain in general. It's a more deconstructive approach, we're breaking it up into its component parts at a, at a systems level so we can, we can study the mechanisms rather than giving rather generic clinical labels to the, to the disorder. We want to break it down into the real nuts and bolts of what's going on. Uh, the Hubble organogram is shown here, I, and uh, I'm uh, privileged to be the scientific director. I think it, I, uh, the analogy is I feel like I'm strapped to the front of a train that everybody else is driving because there are 270 researchers at McGill involved in brain. All want to grab the steering wheel, so it's a lot of fun. Steering wheel, so it's a lot of fun. <laughs> 
So uh, one of the core principles here is that the neuroinformatics, the mechanistic approach to describing brain function, can be applied in many different settings. We're here today to talk about essentially theme two, mechanism models of neurodegenerative diseases. But en passant, it's the same thing for neurodevelopmental disorders and indeed uh, population neuroscience and the influence of social uh, factors on optimization of brain health. That's a, a different story. We got the uh, $84 million for Hubble. Interestingly, uh, you might have seen in the news uh, a lot of excitement at the University of Montreal where Joshua Bengio's group got uh, $93 million to, to look at uh, artificial intelligence and big data. <coughs> Tactically, they didn't talk much about the brain, and we didn't talk much about uh, um, big data in our applications. This, once we got the funding, of course, we got married. So, <laughs> so now we have lots of interactions between people at McGill and people at UDM who are working together to uh, approach these mechanistic problems with the full artillery of deep learning and the high performance computational strategies, which didn't exist a decade ago. And uh, we also have our partner in Ontario who got 66 million. That's $250 million into this area. It's a, it's a huge investment. Now, NeuroHub. I just talked rather glibly about how we're going to use all of this, this, uh, this uh, high, high level uh, computational analytics. And to support that, it doesn't happen overnight. This has been a long process of, of trial and error and uh, this has been developing for some 20, 25 years. I'll talk about two major platforms that underpin what we're, we're talking about. One is so-called C-Brain. C-Brain is essentially a portal, a computer, a, 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 your web portal, to the entire supercomputing network of Canada. And that's about 200,000 processors across the country. It also gives us access to cloud services, which will become increasingly an important driver. We will probably migrate over the next decade to pretty much all on, on uh, cloud services as they, as they become more mature and more straightforward to use. But there are very few places in the world where you have an entire country's endowment in high performance computing is accessible to a particular research community. And that's what the Seabrain portal does. It, it basically makes it easy for your average researcher, clinical researcher who sits here, who doesn't know or care about the idiosyncrasies of the computational infrastructure. They just want their programs to go faster. Uh, at this end, you have, as I said, the, the big computing or the cloud services and the big data servers, and all the data and the analytic workflows sit there. Your researcher just presses the button and the data gets analyzed typically 10 times faster. And that's all handled by this, this uh, web portal, which makes all, all the complexities go away which is what you want. So your data can be anywhere in the country, the computing resources can be anywhere in the country, and the users can be any, anywhere in the country. Indeed, these, these, uh, these pictures don't do justice because, it, in fact, the users can be anywhere in the world. The data can be anywhere in the world, and the users can be anywhere in the world. The second uh, platform that I will mention briefly is the so-called LORIS database. This started life to support an NIH, support an NIH study of pediatric brain development. Um, we've grown it over the years to become a, a, a support for many multi-site, multinational collaborative projects to bring all the data for any given subject uh, to one place. Because it shouldn't be the case, but it is, that too often the imaging sits in one place and the behavioral, psychiatric, psychological testing sits in another place and the genetics sits in another place and you can't pull it all together. It's absurd. When you want to have all of this information available to, uh, to describe any one individual and that's what LORIS provides us. There are better uh, purpose-built genetic databases which have the full co complement of all of the, of the uh, uh, genetic information, but if you want just that information, like uh, uh, what we call CNVs and SLIPs, uh, copy number variants and, uh, and uh, single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphisms, these are various subtypes of genetic information which you want to combine with imaging and behavior, then you assemble all of that information in LORIS. 
And so it becomes a one-stop shop for combining all the information, which then becomes amenable to these very sophisticated analytic engines that you'll hear about some examples from, from Yasa. Importantly, Loris is not just a database for upload and download of all of that data that I just described. It's also um, a, a trial monitoring environment. So if you are collecting data across multiple centers across the country, indeed across multiple countries, um, you have an online acquisition management environment. So, so the researchers and the technological support people can keep track of all the data that's being collected, does it adhere to the right protocol, is it collected at the right time, and all of that nuts and bolts stuff, which can sync a project if it's not done right. And lastly, of course, it's a front end to uh, some very sophisticated analysis workflows, which can run on top of the Seabrain platform. So there's, a, there's a, a, a constant interflow between these two platforms. Interestingly, Loris is also uh, uh, mobile compatible. So if you want to go into the home to collect information about people who are perhaps home housebound and can't get into a central uh, uh, clinic, then you can use uh, this interface to collect the data. Loris is used all over the world for different projects, and that's just a few examples of the, of the projects that are currently underway ar around the world using the Loris platform. An example in the Canadian context you've just heard about, the uh, CCNA, 48 PIs, uh, close to 400 researchers, and as, as Joanne said, I'm in awe that how we can hold all of that together. It, it's a three-ring circus doesn't do it justice. It's a huge, sprawling <laughs> enterprise. On the international scene, I thought I would scene, I thought I would just give you one example. Uh, the guy on the left isn't Fidel Castro, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, Pedro Valdez Sosa, who's a, a longtime colleague of mine. He, he led uh, the, the uh, neuroinformatics and uh, brain mapping efforts for Cuba for the last 30 years. And I am the lucky recipient of many students who passed from Pedro's lab into my lab. And Yasser is, is just the fourth generation of these brilliant young scientists who come from uh, the Cuban school and uh, uh, come to, to particularly come to Canada because they can't go to the US and we like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, basically, uh, they, they didn't have enough money to buy brain scanners, but they had enough money to collect EEG information across the entire population. And they became, and still are, the world leader in the analytics of large-scale electrophysiology data. And so um, it's been a joy to work with the, uh, with the Cuban school, because they, more than anybody else in the world, I think, know how to translate from basic research into the clinic. And Pedro spends half of his time in China, half of his time in Cuba, half of his time in China, and half of his time in the plains. He's, uh, he's a force of nature. Uh, he and I cooked up this scheme a, a couple of years ago that we call the China-Canada-Cuba China axis. And essentially, we're using Seabrain and Loris as a vehicle to share large cohorts and expertise and workflows. Uh, across those three countries, all of which have uh, some form of social, socialized medicine. And so last month I had five people from, uh, from Chengdu in China and four people from Havana who came through the lab to learn about seed brain and loris. An example of why that becomes really, really important is at the, in China, the uh, pr predominant form of dementia is vascular dementia. In the West, it's Alzheimer's disease. Well, why is that? Is it because of genetics? Is it nutrition? Is it lifestyle? Nobody really knows. We hitherto haven't had the means to compare very large, large cohorts from these two worlds, put them together in the same framework, and start to ask interesting questions about the differences between them. So the CCC axis, or as I call it, the new axis of evil, surrounds the US. <laughs> Uh, is, is, a, is a vehicle to allow us to do some really uh, uh, groundbreaking research in, in, in interesting cohorts and really get to the mechanistic basis of dementia. And to wrap up, I just want to show you this pretty picture. It's only got a limited relevance to, to, um, to dementia, but uh, this is a, a data set that, uh, that really is big data. This is the big brain in, in our lab, and it's uh, very, very high resolution, 50 times smaller than an MRI image in every dimension, that means it's 125,000 times larger than a typical MRI volume. Now that's what I call big data. 
And of course, you can do anything you set your mind to when you have vision, determination, and an endless supply of expendable labor. <laughs> there they are. These are the people who do all the work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. So our next, our next speaker is, as you know, I've, I've mentioned already, one of the Lumber Center's goals is to attract young researchers from around the globe and to get them interested in big data research. Our next guest speaker is a perfect example of the kinds of innovative thinkers we're looking to attract to McGill and to Montreal to make it a neuroinformatics hub. A highly sought after researcher, Dr. Yasser Ituria Medina, is a Cuban national and a Banting postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Alan Evans' lab and at the, at the Montreal Neurological Institute. He's also a postdoctoral fellow at the Ludmer Center. His main goal is to create brain models incorporating multiple data sets that will enable us to explain both normal brain development and diseases, such as Alzheimer's, autism, schizophrenia, and many more. Basically, he's developing models that can be applied to multiple types of diseases. He's also working on developing personalized fingerprints for the brain. That will enable us to predict which patients will respond to which treatments based on their individual makeup, their genetics and epigenetics. Dr. Evans calls him a force of nature. For someone so young, he has an impressive publication record, including over 45 papers in peer-reviewed journals, and he's constantly generating new ways to look at big data. Discovery Magazine, in its list of the top 100 scientific discoveries for 2016, ranked him number 12. So please welcome Dr. Aturia Medina. Thanks. First, I would like to uh, thank Joanne and Alan for the support and the invitation for being this lecture. Uh, and I particularly would like to thank you for your interest in, in, our, in our work. I, my presentation would be about how to identify causal mechanisms in neurodegeneration and how this information can be used to identify personalized therapeutic treatments. Uh, first, I will talk about how to identify the causes of Alzheimer's disease and after the which treatment each person uh, should uh, need periodically. As probably you know, or as we all know, Alzheimer's is a very complex disorder. There are multiple hypotheses about which is the causes of it and what uh, uh, provokes this disorder. There is, for example, a prion line hypothesis that proposes that um, toxic proteins in the brain propagate from initial brain regions to other brain regions, propagating the disorder. There, are, there is also a metabolic hypothesis that uh, propose that we don't, uh, there is a fail in the production, in the energy uh, production, which, uh, and then the glia cells and the neuron cells, they don't have enough energy to do the normal task. There is always a vascular hypothesis that try to explain the uh, neurodegeneration by the failing in the vascular system. Uh, there is a, a neuronal activity, the activity degeneration hypothesis. There are multiple hypotheses of Alzheimer's. And the reason of this is that there are mo also multiple factors involved in this disorder. When we have multiple factors involved in, in, uh, in one disorder, one clever way of understanding how uh, it's happening is to create uh, multifactor uh, disease progression models. These models try to establish or to describe the order in factor alterations with disease evolution. Here we have the most popular model of Alzheimer's disease progression in the world. This was proposed uh, around four years ago by Jack Clifford and colleagues from the Mayo Clinic in the state. Uh, according to this model, the first change in the brain in, the, in a person that is developing the disorder will be associated to the presence of the toxic protein that I mentioned. After, then is when we'll be, we will be able to ourselves change, uh, structural change and metabolic change. Uh, in the brain, and only after that is, that is when we will uh, be able to observe cognitive change. This model, however, has important limitations. The first one of them for me is that first is only a hypothetical model. The results are not based uh, or are not extracted directly from the data. Also, it doesn't consider interactions between all the biological factors, 
and it's almost proposing that the actions are caused by only one factor, in this case, the toxic proteins. And finally, as I say, it's only considering one hypothesis, the brain light hypothesis, and it's ignoring, totally ignoring all relevant factors like vascular and functional dysregulation. We are now, like Alan and uh, Howard and Joan were saying, when in the era of the big data analysis. So instead of being created, oh, it could be useful not only to have hypothetical model, but also to extract, to use mathematical model from all the data that we have, to extract the same information or similar information from the data. And then we will not have to be, uh, rel um, uh, let's say, depending on the uh, opinion, of the subjective opinions of the person that are creating hypothetical models. I will intro, uh, present now one uh, or last word try, in which we are trying to do that. And it's a multifactorial causal model of the, uh, that tries to explain how the disease progress. According to this model, we uh, should be uh, able to express the change in a given biological factor at each brain region, let's say, the increase in amyloid in toxin proteins deposition at one brain region as a function of the multi local multifactorial interactions in that region. It means uh, that the, we will have more or less toxic proteins depending on how the vascular system influences the toxic proteins, how the functional activity influences them too, how the structural, uh, structure of the brain changes. In addition, it, it will depend about all the effects coming from all the connected regions in the brain. We know that the regions in the brain are interconnected, and they are not only, connect, not only connected by nervous fibers, they are also connected by uh, arteries, beings, like by the vascular system. Also, there is a glymphatic system that uh, is a, have a role on the clearance of the mifolar proteins. In addition, it will depend on the standard inputs. In this case, internal input means if the person is taking drugs, is it doing physical exercises, which kind of diet is taking the person, which uh, lifestyle is, uh, is following, uh, environmental conditions. Mathematically, we can translate this uh, schematic model to a set of differential equations. I will not enter in details, but the important thing is that <laughs> use, using this equation and uh, big data, we can obtain uh, relevant biological parameters at the individual level that by themselves will be reflecting or explaining uh, the causal mechanisms of the disease uh, progression. Essentially, what we uh, used to do for each subject is to acquire different imaging modalities. For example, we have here five different imaging modalities. We have in fact uh, six including tau uh, imaging for uh, the position of a tau, the toxic tau proteins. Also, we used to include uh, cognitive evaluations, behavioral uh, data, clinical data. We are extending the model now to include uh, proteins information from the periphery. Once that we have this, we can characterize from a multifactorial point of view the alterations that each patient have, and we can do that at each time point that they say at each visit that the person went to the, uh, to the clinic or to the lab. Then applying the model, we can obtain uh, how all the biological factors interact directly. And then we use this information to see which would be the impact that a specific change we have on cognition or on the clinical state of each patient. Because we have a causal model, we also can try to reconstruct the whole history of the disease evolution in that patient, in order to see, to understand which were the initial causes, which were the events that triggered the disorder. We did that for around 500 subjects from the uh, unopened uh, access database, and we found that the uh, vascular dysregulation event is the most prob probable uh, event to trigger uh, the neurodegeneration, at least in this population, and across the whole sample. This is a, a group analysis. Now we are repeating the same analysis to see what happens at each subject, or which was the initial cause at each subject. But more important than that, uh, to know in the initial cause is to understand the causal mechanisms that promote the, uh, the uh, evolution of the disease. When we analyze the uh, causality, the causal diagram between the different factors, we found that all the interactions are relevant. 
If we remove only one of, them, one of them, then we will not be able to explain equally the data. That is suggesting that uh, Alzheimer's disease of neurodegeneration is not dominated by only one biological factor. I say it's not dominated by the toxin proteins or only by the vascular dysregulation or the metabolic dysregulation. In fact, uh, it is mostly dominated by the interaction between all the relevant, uh, all the relevant biological uh, factors, factors that, we are, that uh, should be considered. This is very important because, as I said at the beginning, there are multiple hypotheses, but each of them is only focused on only one biological uh, mechanism. When, in fact, probably, or we should be working on an uh, integrative hypothesis that should consider the, all the factors possible at the, possible at the same time. This is very interesting, but still we don't know how that really will be <laughs> helping us. So, as you know, generalizing medicine considers similar risks, similar doses, and that uh, patients with the same clinical diagnosis will respond in the same way to a given treatment. We know that is not true, and that is why personalizing medicine is proposing to identify the individual risk, uh, which doses need each patient, and it tries also to predict which will be the response of each uh, individual. We are not there yet, and there are uh, multiple reasons why, but there are specific or very important methodological, methodological reasons. Some of them is that, uh, one of them is that we are not working, or of the, in general, the community is not working with causal models, mostly working with uh, association models. Also that we are using broad clinical categories to classify the subjects. I will explain that why, uh, why that is uh, really a problem. One of the main applications of the model that I presented is that if we observe this equation, we, we can notice that if we would like to, uh, let's say, cause a given change in a specific biologic uh, parameters in the brain, or biologic factors in the brain, let's say, if we would like to reduce the level of, before the, of toxic proteins in the brain, we, and we would like to know which signal we have to enter it to, uh, to uh, get this, then we could, we could invert the equation, passing to the, la to, the, to the left side of the equation that standard input that before, uh, uh, which I mentioned before. And then keeping on the right, the desired change and all the other interactions that normally happens. If we apply this to uh, an aging population, the is interesting is that we could observe diff that all, not all the Soviets need the same interventions. I did, for example, I repeat that for, I did that for around 300 Soviets from the same, from the ANIC uh, database, and I found one uh, typical uh, kind of patient that looks like this. What we have here is just the level of deformation that we need to apply to a specific, a specific biologic factor to stop the neurodegeneration. For example, we can see that we will need to apply a lot of change to, uh, tau, uh, to reduce uh, tau proteins and amyloid proteins, so the hyperactivity characteristic of neurodegeneration. But that it could be very uh, be uh, beneficial for this patient to uh, improve or, or to try to target the vascul vascular and metabolic uh, properties of uh, his, uh, his brain. In fact, targeting all the biological factors will only conduce to strong secondary effects, to larger treatment interventions, to higher economic costs, and to all, all the consequences that uh, we know that uh, usually uh, are parallel to uh, the evolution of the disorder. There is all the kind of patient that, by the contrary, is, uh, it would be more benefited from receiving an anti-amyloid and anti-tau tau treatment. Uh, and we could find all the kind of patients that uh, any treatment will not, like any single treatment will not work for them. Uh, and for this kind of patient, probably what they will need or will be more benef beneficial for them is to receive a combinatorial treatment. It means like to target different biological factors at the same time. We're calling these vectors the individual macroscopic intervention fingerprints because they are revealing. First, they are in a uh, characteristic or let's say unique for each person. And they are revealing exactly or which specific macroscopic intervention will be more beneficial for uh, for each individual. 
And in summary, we started first characterizing the interaction between, uh, between toxic proteins in the brain. And then we incorporated uh, other biological factors in order to see how all of them interact. Find, uh, after we introduced clinical cognitive data with the idea of see how uh, macroscopic uh, uh, multifactor interactions impact cognition and the clinical state. And now we are working to incorporate on this model molecular information. And this is what would be closer to say which specific treatment, not only which kind of treatment, but also exact which genes exactly we need to drive in each person, or which proteins we need to uh, modify in each person. Uh, all this combining with use of finally to the identification of effective uh, therapeutic interventions. All these tools we are incorporating them in a software that will be uh, available and it will, we, will, we are planning to share it uh, or to have it also running in the C-Brain platform that, are, that Alan described before. Uh, and it will be, as I said, available to the whole scientific community. It not only will it uh, allow us to identify cause and mechanisms in different disorders, not only in neurodegeneration, but also which treatments will be beneficial, uh, which could be the effects uh, of a specific treatments even before of applying them. And this is essentially in what we are working now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I think you know after seeing that presentation why we need someone so brilliant to actually work with these huge data sets. <laughs> I'd like to, so our next speaker is Dr. John Breitner. Dr. Breitner is a research scientist and director of the Center for Studies on Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease at the Douglas Institute. He's also professor of psychiatry in the Faculty of Medicine at McGill. Dr. Breitner is a highly published researcher in Alzheimer's disease. He has devoted his career to investigating factors that modify an individual's risk of developing Alzheimer's. In the last decade, Dr. Breitner led the pioneering Alzheimer's disease anti-inflammatory prevention trials, one of only of a handful of large primary prevention trials designed to test the abilities of specific interventions to reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's disease in elderly people. He currently leads the Center for Studies on Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease. The center evaluates how well prevention treatments work in individuals who possess certain biomarkers thought to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. These biomarkers appear to track the development of Alzheimer's disease in its pre-symptomatic stages, which will be crucial for us to, um, to develop early intervention strategies. Based on this clinical studies and research, we asked Dr. Breitner to share his expertise on the potential for big data research to change our understanding of early diagnosis and prevention. Please welcome Dr. Breitner. Thank you, Joanne. And I'd like to express my personal gratitude to my drinking buddy, uh, Irving Ludmer, here in the front row. We are actually in a wine and food society together, so I've gotten to know Irving and Freema pretty well uh, over the last uh, year or so. Um, uh, so uh, I want to start with a question, if I may. Um, how many people in this room are older than 80 years? Would you mind raising your hand? So maybe that's 40, 50, something like that. Okay. Statistically speaking, I'm not saying it applies in this case, but statistically speaking, 20% of people over the age of 80 have all of the neuropathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease in their brains, but they're not demented. And that is an enormous puzzle uh, but potentially a great clue for um, how we might think about trying to prevent this disease. Something is special about these people. Um, so I want to start, uh, I'll tell you a little story that leads up to this as a sort of a culmination. And uh, it's just one story among many uh, in uh, efforts to try to solve the riddle uh, of this uh, disease, um, but the story uh, begins here. 
Uh, Howard already mentioned that we have been interested for many years in the role of uh, inflammatory changes in Alzheimer's disease. And this distinguished Canadian whom you see, Dr. Patrick McGeer from uh, Vancouver, uh, in the late 1980s was the first to make a published note of the fact that there is extensive inflammatory change in the brains of people uh, with Alzheimer's disease. And he thought, well, that can't be good because inflammatory change uh, in many circumstances promotes all kinds of tissue damage and other nasties. Uh, so uh, he was interested in the idea that uh, preventing uh, this kind of inflammation might very well be a solution to uh, the, this uh, disease. And indeed, um, a number of uh, individuals, uh, myself and uh, many others, uh, uh, went out and did studies. Uh, there are about 25 studies of uh, this sort that showed that people who um, um, uh, were taking anti-inflammatory treatments did, in fact, appear to have uh, lesser incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that was quite exciting at the time until we discovered that it really wasn't true once you got past the age of 70 or 75. Um, we actually did um, a large number of different trials, including some showing these medicines that you see on your screen, and the long and short of it is that none of them um, worked. So uh, we said, well, gee, I mean, uh, how can that be? Um, and basically, we were sort of stymied with the inflammation story until I uh, had a sit down with my new graduate student, uh, Pierre Francois um, uh, Meyer, brilliant fellow. You'll hear more about him later, I'm sure. Um, and I said, Pierre, let's see if we can figure out what inflammation has to do with this phenomenon that I was talking about earlier of people being spared the symptoms of the disease despite the fact that they have the pathology. So he said, okay, um, and he's a very enterprising fellow, and he went into this Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging or ADNI database, public access database that we've heard about in this talk, and he said, I'm going to look at um, markers of inflammation in the cerebrospinal fluid of these people, and I'm going to look at uh, what that tells us about the um, uh, uh, inflammatory state in these people, but I'm also going to look and uh, see what I can learn about the pathology in these people, how many people are showing biomarkers to indicate that they actually have the disease, and I'm going to uh, ask the question by and the way, are these people demented? Are they, do they have mild cognitive impairment or do they um, uh, uh, are uh, in fact uh, healthy uh, controls? So there's a lot of data on this slide and I apologize for that, but if you'll bear with me, I'll try to take you through it very quickly. So what we're looking at here is, first of all, this stage zero, stage one, stage two, that just means um, no pathology on the left, plaques at stage one, or plaques and tangles at stage two, okay? And we're measuring immune markers on the uh, vertical axis there, so the higher the uh, score, the higher the inflammatory activity going on in the spinal fluid and therefore probably in the brain of uh, these people. And then the final thing that you see here is they're broken out by clinical diagnostic groups. So the green guys are healthy controls, okay? The blue guys have mild cognitive impairment and the red guys have Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, dementia. And you can sort of break this out by stage and you can see that um, the people who, um, let's say it's stage one, people who are healthy at stage one have much higher inflammatory scores than people who have dementia. It's also true at stage two. People who are healthy at stage two have a much higher inflammatory scores, again, than people who have dementia. So having a lot of inflammation in your brain seems to be good. <laughs> so I'm saying to myself, well, maybe that's why these trials of anti-inflammatory treatments didn't work. 
um, because if uh, inflammation is good, the last thing you would want to do is try to suppress uh, uh, inflammation. So we sat down and we thought about this and we thought, well, what do we know about this condition and this, this whole business? So we go all the way back to Pat McGear, where we know that uh, people who have um, Alzheimer pathology, and I don't know if we have a pointer here, but I can just point, um, have a lot of inflammation. Now, we don't know that the Alzheimer pathology causes the inflammation, but most people would guess that's the way the arrow should point, okay? Um, and we know the people who have Alzheimer's disease, on average, have symptoms and they get worse, okay? Alzheimer pathology. Well, that's not much to go on, but now we have this inflammation story and it looks like this. And I've got the arrow in blue indicating that it's upside down or inverted. That is to say, a lot of inflammation means symptoms are better. Progression is slower, okay? How can that be? Well, we do know a couple of things about what inflammation does in the brain, and we do know a couple of things uh, in the last few years about the causes of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and Yasser actually talked a little bit about that. Uh, one of the things that we've learned most particularly about Alzheimer's disease in the last uh, oh, half dozen years or so is that as far as amyloid is concerned, the problem with human uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease, not mice, humans, um, is that they don't clear amyloid very well from their brains. The problem is a clearance problem. It's not an overproduction problem. That's the mice. The mice are engineered to overproduce amyloid, so it's not a very good model, actually, for um, human um, Alzheimer's disease, late onset uh, Alzheimer's disease. But clearance seems to be important, and, and more clearance seems to be good. Now, we know from the animal literature that actually um, inflammation promotes clearance, or we think it promotes clearance. When there's high inflammation, there's more clearance. These kinds of things are always associations rather than causal facts until you demonstrate the causality. But So I put a little question mark here again to denote that maybe we don't know for sure that it's the inflammation that's promoting the clearance rather than the other way around, but it's plausible or more likely than not. And we also know that, a, that the clearance of A-beta is good for you. It reduces symptoms, it reduces the progression of, um, of, of uh, uh, Alzheimer's symptoms, and it probably uh, reduces the continuing development of Alzheimer's disease pathology. So we have a model or we have a hypothesis. The hypothesis goes like this. That arrow that just disappeared is actually an artifact. It results from the fact that you've got this cycle going on here. Pathology promotes inflammation, promotes clearance, suppresses symptoms, okay? Uh, even to the point where there may not be a direct causal link between the pathology and the symptoms. It may all reside in this kind of mechanism. Well, that's a nice model, but what do you do with a thing like that? Well, I knew what to do with a thing like that. I, that. <laughs> so I said, Yasser, can you do your magic with this? And he said, can I have 36 hours? I said, yes. <laughs> so he went home and did some magic. And I think I've got the name of the technique correctly written out here. To me, it's, it's really, it's Greek to me, but, but um, uh, it's, um, uh, the, point, the point is that this is a, um, a big data um, approach that doesn't start with hypothesis testing. It lets the data try to lead us into understanding what's actually going on. And not only that, but it has the capability to tell us when there's a causality relationship between two things that we want to look at in the, in the, in the disease. So Yasser came back with this. And I thought, <laughs> oh boy, it's a great Christmas tree ornament. Um, um, but I, I, actually, I, I have to actually point here just so you can, you can see. There's a few, this looks like, I don't know. Um, but there's, what he's done, risk factor. 
factors for Alzheimer's disease. But also, remember we were studying in between Mark. So look over here, okay? Oh, is there actually a pointer? Oh, I don't think There's a mouse? Oh, that'll help. Okay. Oh, that's true. <laughs> so look, there's some reassuring things here. What we're trying to look at here is these things in relationship specifically to clearance. Okay, we've, clearance is good. We want clearance. Okay. Well, we know that clearance goes down with aging, and sure enough, it does. We can even, even tell why it goes down with aging, because this is blue, and that means that this um, nasty stuff is, which is a representative of what gets cleared from the brain is actually down. Okay, and we go across here and we lost our mouse. Okay, here, here's a, an interesting one, ApoE4. So that's the big gene that is the most uh, potent gene for uh, Alzheimer's disease and E4 is the bad version of that. Um, and look here, um, this A beta 42 stuff is way, way down which is bad, means there's no clearance, okay, um, in people who have the E4 allele. So that's expected. Okay, so we move over here to the immune markers, and we find that this guy and this guy and these guys are all associated with increased clearance, okay? We expected that. We had the, the observation that in increasing inflammation <sighs> would be associated with an improved outcome. We hypothesized that it was clearance uh, that was responsible for it. And by golly, what we see here is that these immune markers are causing a decrease in, um, sorry, an increase in clearance, which is represented by the red here on the bottom bars, okay? So I said, what else can you do? Well, he said, okay, let's do this. <clears throat> so now what he's looking at We've got clearance down here on the bottom because what we're looking at on the vertical axis is a whole bunch of different markers of ongoing development of Alzheimer's disease as revealed both by clinical symptoms and by a bio, very prominent biomarker here, this tau to A beta 42 ratio, which is in, measured in the cerebrospinal fluid. When that guy's up, things are bad, okay? Um, and you see um, age, well, uh, this is a summary indicator when age goes up. This, when this goes up, that's bad. Um, here's a cognitive uh, measure. When uh, uh, age is high, that goes down. You expect that, okay. So, so far it's behaving very nicely. Here's ApoE4 again, and bingo. Here's this tau to A beta 42 ratio that I was talking about just a moment ago, and it's way, way, way down, indicating once again that um, this, 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 this variant of the gene is causing a marker of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, well that's uh, hardly surprising. It's to be expected. Um, uh, it, the point is that all of this is behaving pretty well as you would like it to, and it's giving you some important uh, new information because these are causal relationships. What's down here on the bottom is causing what you're seeing here uh, on, the, on the vertical axis. So I said, well, what about the immune markers, Yasser? And he said, oh, well, we can put them in the model too. There are nine of them, but we can just uh, add them. And I said, well, isn't that gonna blow the model to smithereens? I mean, you'd add nine new variables to a model like this. It's pretty delicate stuff. Oh, I neglected to tell you, this is based on 68 samples of spinal fluid taken at baseline from a cohort of people, of over 500 people that we're actually following at, the, at the, the Douglas. So this is minuscule amounts of data that's giving us these kinds of um, expected and, and fascinating um, uh, interrelationships. Uh, well, he adds the immune markers, okay, and there's two things to notice here. So um, uh, <clears throat> this uh, immune marker one, if I'm reading this correctly, is associated with this guy which is change in the cognitive. So the fact that that's positive means that there's less change because it's actually a subtraction of the second score from the first score, okay? So basically it's telling us again that this immune one that we saw before is, 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 is causing 
a positive clinical outcome. Then we go over here to this immune nine guy. So the thing about immune nine is immune nine is not pro-inflammatory. Immune nine is actually anti-inflammatory. It has the two most powerful um, markers that we have uh, to telling us that, uh, that basically this suppresses inflammation. And now what we see here, let me do it again, is get my mouse back, okay. So here's this tau to A beta 42 ratio thing again, okay. So look here, um, um, when immune nine is up, meaning the anti-inflammatory marker is up, tau to A beta 42 is up. Remember, tau to A beta 42 is bad, okay. So with 68 samples of sp spinal fluid taken at baseline only, um, we're able to see all of these different relationships suggesting that um, um, immune markers are associated with an improvement in clearance, they're associated with improved outcomes, um, at just as the uh, original observation in the ADNI data set was uh, telling us, and that clearance is associated with, uh, or actually causal to, improved outcomes. So, you know, if we had complete confidence in all of this, we could pack it up and go home and say basically we've proved our case. Obviously we haven't done that. We need to do a great deal more over the next uh, uh, few years and you can tell your friends at the NIH because we're writing a grant to try to do that uh, <laughs> right now. Um, but um, let me tell you, for a guy who didn't know what big data was or um, uh, anything remotely uh, like that, to come here and have these kinds of things sort of laid out in front of him just because he had an interesting uh, a problem in clinical observations. Well, <laughs> it converted me, okay? I'm a believer. Uh, this is uh, St. Paul uh, on the way to Damascus uh, having his, why are you laughing? He started a religion, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to start a religion or try to, but, but I am a convert, and uh, I just wanted to tell you that and show how the big data approach came to this very old, very problematic question in this disease. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I th our next guest is April Hay Hayward, and our next and last guest. She's the Director of Programs and Services at the Alzheimer's Society of Montreal, who is the co-host for this evening. So without further ado, I'm going to let her come up and tell to you a little bit about some of the services that the, uh, the Society offers. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, it's a real wonderful opportunity for us to be involved in this evening. I want to uh, give a special thanks to the Ludmer Center um, for partnering with us for this event, and especially to Joanne Clark for all the efforts that go into coordinating uh, this evening. Thank you. Yes. I know I'm the last talk, so I will try to uh, move it along. Um, this evening, we've been privileged to hear uh, about some incredible cutting-edge research that's taking place here in our own city. Uh, it's truly amazing, um, all of the advances that are taking place and all of those promising avenues. And we certainly look forward to the day when we can say we finally have a solution for Alzheimer's disease. That's what we hear from families as well and what they wish for the most. Um, until that day comes, um, the reality is that for people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease today, and dementia today, and their family members, life continues. Life goes on. It goes on with an amazing amount of resilience and strength. It goes on often with actually a surprising amount of joy, but it goes on as well with tremendous challenges um, and with a lot of difficulties. And that's why the Alzheimer's Society of Montreal exists. Life doesn't end when Alzheimer's begins. Right now in Montreal, we estimate that roughly 33,000 people are living with dementia. Uh, that sounds like a lot of people already. We know that those numbers are expected to double in only 15 to 20 years. And for each person diagnosed, uh, many more are affected. Spouses, children, grandchildren, 
Uh, I read a statistic yesterday that said uh, at least two in three Canadians personally know someone living with dementia. And I'm willing to bet that if I asked you to raise your hands here in this room, there's probably a great majority of us that are touched in some way by dementia. Dementia does not come with an instruction manual. It doesn't come with a clear roadmap where we can say, here's what you can expect and here's what you should do. Um, those things are very gray. Um, it's a very complex condition that can affect each person very differently. Uh, and um, at the Alzheimer's Society of Montreal, we certainly don't have all the answers. We don't have this handy instruction booklet that we can give to each person for whom it's going to all be the same. But by equipping ourselves with best practices, by associating with the research community and the education community, we use all of the tools at our disposal and all the knowledge at our disposal to accompany people through that uncertain journey. Uh, we adhere to what we call a person-centered approach. That's certainly not unique to us, but when we say a person-centered approach, what we mean by that is seeing the person before their diagnosis, who they were and who they still are, allowing the person to do what they're still capable of doing, choosing to see what they're still capable of doing, no matter what stage of the illness they're at, giving them the time and the space they need to express themselves, and adapting to their reality instead of expecting that they can adapt to ours. The Alzheimer's Society of Montreal is part of a network of Alzheimer's societies throughout Canada. Uh, here in the province of Quebec, there are 20 regional Alzheimer's societies and all we represent the territory of Montreal. We also have uh, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada that works on national priorities and research efforts. And there's probably a lot of projects in this room that may even be funded by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. We all share the same mission, which you can read here. I don't need to read for you, but essentially what that means is we provide direct support to people who are affected by dementia, people who are diagnosed in their families. We also um, engage in efforts to uh, create public awareness and education um, and provide training and education to anyone who's working with people who have dementia uh, or anyone who encounters people who have dementia. So I'm gonna go through our services uh, kind of as quickly as I can. I really urge you to take some of our documentation, which is uh, at the table outside um, the back entrance there, which goes through more of the details specifically. So this is our team of counselors. Uh, it, they're all a wonderful, knowledgeable, and friendly bunch. Um, one of these counselors is our intake counselor, so he's available on the phone Monday to Friday. He's answering questions, and he's often doing that first contact with people when they're calling us and wondering what to do and what they can get involved in. We also have a counselor that's identified to each territory of Montreal. We uh, divide the territories into five, the same as the CIUS, if you're familiar with that model. So no matter where you live in Montreal, there's a, there's a counselor that's been assigned to your area and wh whom you can get in contact with. And through the financial support of La Puy Montréal and through an uh, incredible amount of partnerships, um, we, uh, these counselors are available to meet with um, caregivers in more than, now more than 16 uh, different locations. So this is a pro project that's um, allowed us a lot of flexibility and diversity in the services to really meet families where they are. Uh, if there's problems with transport or getting to us, we can go to them. They could provide free confidential counseling, training about the disease, information resources and support. Caregivers can also participate in different types of support groups. Educational support groups where they can learn and better understand uh, about dementia and get some uh, practical strategies. Monthly support groups where they can ongoingly support each other, sometimes over a number of years as long as they feel the need. Uh, this past two years we developed a specific bereavement support group. This really came from caregivers who came back to us who after losing the person they cared for um, and who wound up seeking support and more general bereavement services came back to us and said, you know, I feel like my, my experience is kind of unique. I really didn't feel like I fit in. And we explored the research there and found that um, grieving experiences when you've been caring for someone with dementia do have a lot of unique features. And uh, along with uh, the organization Maison Montbourquette, we adapted uh, a group to address those needs specifically. Um, they can also participate in a lot of types of educational events and webinars um, through partnerships and uh, also some wellness activities such as meditation. We also run um, what we call Alzheimer cafes. What is an Alzheimer cafe? Um, so it's not just hanging out at your local Starbucks, although it can sometimes feel like that. Um, and you will find in most of them um, Starbucks coffee, actually. Um, but at an Alzheimer cafe, um, first of all, it's open to everybody. It's, they're heavily attended by caregivers, but also people with dementia, uh, professionals, and really anyone who's kind of interested in the topic. At a typical Alzheimer cafe, uh, you'll probably have the chance to hear a talk by a local expert on any given topic. 
um, we've been super fortunate uh, to have uh, really leading experts coming into our cafes to chat with our participants, including Dr. Trudko, um, and many others probably cafe presenters are in this room. Um, and it's a chance for people to kind of informally socialize, meet each other, uh, and, um, and, uh, and enjoy themselves. Uh, it's a service that they don't have to sign up for. You don't have to divulge any personal information or get on a list. So sometimes people feel more comfortable dropping into this type of meeting um, than they do signing up for a more formal support group, for example. So that's been a nice success. Um, as people move along uh, in the, the disease, they need more adapted approaches. And for people in the moderate to advanced stages of the disease, through our respite and stimulation services, they can engage in many types of, um, of activities that are stimulating, that are therapeutic, and that are fun. Um, we have a, a really qualified staff uh, that through these activities who are all people who have a background, who have a diploma, and on top of that, who receive more than 18 hours of additional training from the Alzheimer's Society. Um, and because of that, caregivers can really feel like the person that they're leaving in our care is very well taken care of. They can have peace of mind. Um, that they're not just um, getting a break for themselves, but they're also providing the person with the stimulation that they deserve. Um, we talked about counseling services for caregivers, but for people with dementia, they can also benefit from an approach that's really personalized to them. Um, this is not requested as often. It's not every person diagnosed with dementia that can or wants to talk about their experience, but for those that really want to process that diagnosis and, and, um, and look at strategies for maintaining their abilities and adjusting to that reality, this is something that's available and support groups are available for them as well. People with dementia at our center in St. Henry can also um, enjoy a whole range of socialization stimulation um, meetings. We call these the meetups, the Monday meetups, the Thursday meetups, um, as well as a new Tales and Travels group with the Westmount Library. This is a, a really fun program that the library approached us with. So through the theme of travel, um, participants uh, really engage in stimulation activities, reminiscence, um, and they do it in a library in a community context. So participants really love this. Why? Because they're not going to a hospital. They're not going to a care center. When you go to the library, it's a very normal place to meet, to engage in an activity and to meet other people, and this feels very normalized to them, and they benefit from the adapted approach. Um, if you were to visit our uh, center in, uh, in St. Henry, in Notre Dame, and if you haven't come to visit us, I strongly encourage you to, you would see that our walls are really lined with a lot of artwork. It's very colorful when you walk in. All of that artwork comes from participants in our art therapy workshops. Um, these take place four times a week, and they're especially beneficial. They allow for creativity and self-expression. They help people um, build their confidence, and um, they're especially useful for people that have a hard time expressing themselves using other means. Um, we also partner with uh, the Museum of Fine Arts. So once a month, our group goes to visit the museum. The educators of the museum have received specialized training from the Alzheimer's Society, and they adapt guided visits um, for our, our population and their families, um, including a creative workshop in their studios. And they have a much nicer studio than we do, and it's a really, it's popular. Everyone wants to go to the museum. Um, as an official Alzheimer's Society, we also promote the Medical Alert Safely Home Bracelet. So this is a, a program through which people um, can get access to an identification bracelet, um, and that allows emergency response workers to identify them more easily and to return them safely home in the event of an emergency. And to sign up for this program, people can find all the information on our website or at our offices, and our counselors can even help uh, with the forms. Um, finally, a lot of people don't realize that we're also available for healthcare professionals to provide training in all up to 30 hours of training um, through a lot of diverse programs. Um, the best thing to do if you're interested in that kind of training is to call us and we can talk a bit about your profile, what you're interested in, in learning, um, and get connected with, um, with a group that's taking place. We can also provide this training in the workplace, and that's a really great opportunity when, they, when we have the chance to go into the workplace and train whole teams in using the same approach, and it often has more success in implementing some of these approaches. Uh, and finally, we're available um, to give talks to, to, to talk about um, uh, dementia. We have a number of conferences that we give, either a staff member or a trained group of volunteers, um, different types of presentations. Many of these presentations have also been translated into multiple languages. Um, and uh, working alongside community groups, um, cultural communities, we've been able to use some of this information and um, reach some more marginalized uh, communities that don't have access to a lot of information about Alzheimer's and dementia and might be more reluctant to seek help. Um, 
and that's it. I've said a lot of things. Uh, how can you access our services? We're very accessible, so it's you don't need a special code or anything. You can just give us a call. You can send us an email, uh, and like I said, a counselor can um, take your call. All of our counselors are bilingual, uh, if not trilingual, and um, all of our services are offered in, in French and English as much as possible, and sometimes in other languages as well. For the healthcare professionals in the room, we also have a, a tool called First Link, and that allows you to really refer your clients or your patients directly to us and allow us to follow up with them. That's our fall program. You should take it at the table if you don't already have it. And so I just want to end on a note of gratitude. All of this is made possible by supporters, donors, uh, staff, volunteers, etc. It's a, it, we're a well-supported organization, and we thank you very much for your attention today. So I'm conscious of the time, so we'll keep the question and answer period very, very short, 10 minutes. What I'd like to happen is we actually have, um, we've given you cue cards. If anyone has a question they want to ask, please write it onto the cue card. And my volunteers, if you will pick those up and bring them down to me, thank you. If I can get our presenters to come up to the front and also the, we'll set up with the mics. And while we're doing that, I want to take this time to thank all of the volunteers who helped make this possible. Often, I, a lot of them came from the Alzheimer's Society. I have to tell you, even some of them called me up at the last instant and said that, uh, oh, can we still get in to see it? And I said, um, are you a student? And they said, yes. I said, do you want to volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have three here who actually called up to get a seat and ended up volunteering. So, if my volunteers could actually collect the cue cards, just hold them up. So Dr. Evans is going to read out the questions and direct it to the person he thinks is uh, best uh, situated to answer that. Thanks. Um, I'm missing a cue card. I have this question. I have this question. Saturated yet? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go through some of these, uh, these question and answers. The first question is, um, since 98% of Canadians cannot spell Alzheimer's, let's call it what it is, dementia. It's 100 years old. I don't think that's a, a question, it's a comment. We'll take that under advisement, Dr. Cherko. Has any link uh, been found between hyperactivity and later dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Um, Howie? We're on. Um, there really hasn't been a link found between hyperactivity in children and Alzheimer's disease at this point. That's that's an e that's a quick one. Okay. Is there a correlation between the level of brain inflammation, cortisol level, and cortisol levels? Are you measuring basically CSF or said rate correlations. So this is a somewhat different kind of inflammation than we're used to thinking about when we uh, talk about things like arthritis. Um, uh, this is called innate inflammation. It's mediated by specialized cells that are uh, in the brain. They secrete things locally those things do find their way into the cerebrospinal fluid, and that's where we um, measure them. Um, this question about um, uh, cortisol levels, um, no, there's no direct correlation between cortisol levels and these kinds of inflammatory markers. 
cortisol levels go up and down very uh, quickly. Uh, these markers tend to be relatively common because they reflect the ongoing metabolic activity of the brain and the ongoing cellular innate immunity that's, that's um, in, in the brain. So you wouldn't necessarily see a sed rate going up and you wouldn't necessarily see uh, changes in cortisol level with this. Although I, you know, I should say that that's not 100% flat-footed certainty, but I would not expect it. Next question. What is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? I'll take that one. There are many different types of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is one subtype of dementia. In the US, one can do spec scans in your 50s and determine if you have plaques. Can we do them here? So um, it's, well, it's not spec scans, it's PET scans. They're a slightly different form of scans. Um, this is interesting. There's uh, uh, PET scans have been around for uh, uh, how many years? PET scans? PET scans. 30 years. The first PET scanner in Canada was actually at the Montreal Neurologic Institute. Uh, but the development that has been a big breakthrough in the past 12 years was development of injectable ligands that bind to the amyloid in the brain. So they're attached to a radioactive molecule. They're injected intravenously. They go to the brain. They bind to the uh, amyloid in the brain. And uh, it's a, a, a sensitive test that shows if you have amyloid in the brain. Now, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean you have Alzheimer's disease? It turns out that you can live to be 80, 90 years old. You can have a positive amyloid scan with amyloid in your brain and not develop dementia. So just having amyloid in the brain does not mean that, that you are going to get dementia. But if you do get dementia, it's almost certainly Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's is typified by amyloid in the brain. On the other hand, it's now clear that you can take people in their 50s and 60s and do a scan and see amyloid in the brain even though they have no memory problems, and this does increase, it's associated with an increased risk of going on and getting Alzheimer's disease. So what do you do with these scans? In the United States, they've uh, decided that, that people can get these scans done, and their Medicare will, will, can be billed for it, and there's actually a big study going on now, $40 million study, to see if we let people get these scans, which cost about $4,000 a, a piece, will it make them healthier? Will it help doctors to take care of them? Will it change their management? In Canada, we've remained quite skeptical that, that although it's interesting for the doctors and academically and very important in research studies, is it really a good use of, of uh, health care dollars right now to get these very expensive scans in, in potentially everybody over age 65. So these are now available in the United States and we can do them in Canada. It's just that at this point, Medicare, there's no province in Canada that where Medicare has decided to pay for them. And the doctors haven't even recommended when we meet and, and had a consensus conference on recommendations for government we didn't recommend that they be paid for. So the status of these scans, it's sort of right now more of an investigational tool in Canada. Um, can somebody clarify the difference between vascular degeneration and Alzheimer's disease? Uh, perhaps, Yasser? Yeah, yeah. um, Alzheimer's is more related to the presence of amyloid and tau. And vascular is related to the pro, uh, deficiencies or alterations in the vascular system. It is not very clear yet how much vascular uh, dysregulation influences Alzheimer. Uh, um, but there is a, a theory saying that, they, in fact, they, they, they are together or they are very similar. However, the classic vascular dysregulation or vascular dementia is have only, these patients only have vascular proneness. And the classic Alzheimer's what this patient should have is only a, a very uh, characteristic uh, pattern of amyloid deposition in the brain and tau deposition. In spite of the durable nature of the am beta amyloid proteins, 
have there been any efforts to develop treatments which hydrolyze or otherwise break down these plaques? If so, of what kind? I, I think it's in interesting to note that uh, it's not clear that uh, plaques are in fact a bad thing. What we think is, is, is the toxic aspect of, of beta amyloid is soluble amyloid. It's floating around in, 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 the, uh, uh, in, the, in the brain. They can attack different uh, important aspects of brain function. It may be that the, the plaques themselves are a protective me mechanism. They're taken out of, out of the soluble uh, milieu and deposited in plaques, but they can't do any more harm. The increased clearance story that you've heard about today, it may be not that it's clearing plaques as such, it's clearing the soluble amyloid that, that might be the important element. John? It's probably worth mentioning, though, that the, many of the trials, the vaccine trials in particular, that have been attempted to treat this disease, it's been shown that these vaccines are actually successful in getting rid of the amyloid. Uh, the plaques and, and the like. So plaques are not actually there forever. They, they, they're in dynamic equilibrium with the stuff that's going on around them, and you can get rid of them. The problem is it doesn't do any good. As I said, it may be the plaques are a, a good thing. Uh, has any link been found between hyperactivity and later dementia or Alzheimer's disease? I, there you go, a working example of what we're studying. <laughs> Will the slides used in your presentations be uh, uh, available? If so, how? Um, yes. I, I believe, yes. And through? Through the Ludmer Center. Through the Ludmer Center. send out a message to everyone who registered. If you haven't registered and you're here, just contact me. Explain why China has, uh, has uh, mainly vascular dementia. Can't. <laughs> That's why we have the CCC access to, to go and try and find out. And does the province uh, or Canada have a prevention strategy? I think we've heard a lot today about different elements, but I think the question is, is there a, a unified strategy? There, there, First of all, there, there's nothing unified in Canada. Healthcare is province by province. Um, but there is no uh, federal or national strategy on how to combat dementia. There's no unified uh, dementia plan in Canada. There have been some provincial plans. So the Howard Bergman, who's based at the Jewish General, led a, a group of us to devise a plan suggesting for the Quebec government which is how to put into place care at the primary care and how to better uh, change the system to make it easier to diagnose dementia and easier to take care of people with dementia. Uh, and there have been a number of provincial plans focused on care. Uh, but what we need is, in addition to, to that, uh, an overall strategy, for example, on prevention. You know, as was mentioned, we have some clues about things that may be useful in prevention, and those range from uh, things like education and diet and, and maybe some dietary manipulations, avoiding head trauma, uh, exercise, social engagement, uh, uh, intellectual activity, all these things that have been shown to be associated with lower or later incidence of, or occurrence of dementia. But we don't really know the dose or how these have to come into play. People ask me, if I, I read that wine uh, can prevent dementia, how much wine should I take and <laughs> what time of day? And, um, and you know, should I take it with anti-inflammatory agents or with orange <laughs> juice? And how about do I need chocolate? Can I put chocolate in the wine? So, so, so what we need is, is large-scale, probably international prevention studies to see what's the combination, the dosage, the timing, what people can do, because people want to know, what can I be doing now to prevent dementia 20, 30 years from now? And this is, this is what is lacking. There is a, a, again, there was a national, there was a, a bill passed in Parliament to create a national dementia strategy, and this was passed in, in the springtime, so we're still waiting to see anything come of the bill and see whether the government is going to actually say this is worth putting money into developing. 
Uh, so in the in interest of time, I'm going to wrap things up. The, the question here is what can we do to prevent Alzheimer's or dementia disease? I, I think you've just heard the strategies that we're, we're developing. Is Al it's Al Al Alzheimer's uh, uh, related to genetics? I think you've heard yes. Uh, certainly many, many aspects of it are. And th I think this is a, a fascinating question. Do we know why women are more affected? Two theories. <laughs> so the simple answer is that women live longer than men, and the older you are, the higher your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So right there, it probably accounts for a substantial portion of it. But there's actually more to it than that. Um, if you look age by age at the rates for women and for men, um, they are identical up until about age 80. And after age 80, the women develop the disease comp at comparable ages, develop the disease at higher rates than men. Now there's speculation and theory about why that should be the case. Uh, one common theory is that having menopause is not good for your brain. Um, <laughs> I, I, I can't speak from experience on that. I'm not touching that. <laughs> but um, uh, there's a lot of evidence that estrogen deprivation is injurious to nerve cells. Uh, and uh, there's some evidence to suggest that the effects of that are delayed for 20 or 30 years, which would make sense in as much as we know that the disease, Alzheimer's disease, goes on for about 20 or 30 years and before people actually have dementia. So that's only a theory, um, but uh, there are differences in the rates after age 80. I think uh, you want us to stop, right? Okay. Yeah. So I apologize to uh, other questions that are still here, but we could be here all night and, and uh, I've been given the hook by, by the boss. So thank you very much for your questions, everybody. So I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. If you found the work that uh, our researchers are doing here interesting, I urge you to visit their websites. I urge you to visit the Ludmer Center website. And if you're really interested, help us out. Um, come in, talk to us about how you can get involved and help advance the work in big data research by perhaps making a donation and assisting us to carry this forward. Thank you very much. And thank you to my speakers.